Hello everyone and welcome back to the VUCA Insight Podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship, investing and a growth mindset. Today, um, I'm very honoured and humbled that uh, our guest has actually allowed me to use their facility to actually interview. Uh, he's none other than JJ Chai or Jia Jun, uh, Chief Strategy Officer for Yinsen. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to use the facility to interview you. Thank you for coming to our office. Uh, you know, we've been following you from your previous uh, gig at uh, FRL, yeah, and now to VUCA, yeah, uh, I know uh, we like the work you're doing. Thank you to support it. Thank you. Um, so let's start off straight at the bat. Um, what was a 15 year old JJ like? <laughs> wow, 15 year old. Uh, Anglo Chinese school, I remember, right? Yeah, at 15, I was in Singapore uh, doing my O levels. Um, Probably in secondary three. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, any hungry ambitions back then? Do you had an idea where you want to go? No, no, no clear idea. You know, I think back then, you know, we, all, we I think we probably around the same era. You know, the parents just want you to do uh, stay in the science course. Yeah. <laughs> keep your options open. <laughs> correct. Correct. Uh, yeah. And then and then figure it out later, right? That's uh, right. There was no such thing as uh, Kidzania for you to experience any. W- 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 <laughs> <laughs> any, any any idea of what working life would be like, or or even talk to a cost counselor or career yeah, counselor, yeah. right? No, no ideas, right? Okay, you know, if you ask me back then, what was all I guess I wouldn't have known. If you ask me what is uh, um, a research analyst, I wouldn't have known. Got it, got it. Um, you went into the cosmetics industry. You know, you were managing a manufacturing plant, and you know, um, I think it was a good eight years or nine years, and then you sold it off. You know, tell us what you did there. What got you into the cosmetic industry? And what what made it exciting actually for you? In Vietnam, some more, and you are not Vietnamese, right? Yeah, I mean, I was twenty seven. I was uh, working in a boutique corporate finance outfit. Okay. We we advise uh, private equity investor entering into the cosmetic manufacturing business. Okay. Right, and when we looked at the landscape, we saw the opportunity uh, of localizing uh, uh, manufacturing in Vietnam. I see. Because when we understood how many containers were being sent from Malaysia, we, we saw a huge op- opportunity to localize all that uh, production. I see. Uh, on the back of all the uh, incentives that were being given by the Vietnam government for uh, FDIs. Okay. Do this? Do those policies still exist till to this day? I think they have uh, watered down those incentives. I know back then it included like five years tax free, um, a bunch of stuff you know uh, that would basically help uh, you know any new uh, investments uh, in manufacturing or any business. Okay. Um. You did you enjoy that time? I mean, like cosmetics. I, I'm pretty sure like. If you, you were to ask a 15-year-old JJ and, and what you got into, were there things that surprised you that you liked? Were there things that surprised you that you disliked about that, that industry, actually? I think manufacturing is manufacturing. It's, uh, once you get it, it's, the operation is smooth. It's, it's, everything is easy, right? Mm. I think the fun part was trying to do something in a new environment in Vietnam. Uh, trying to learn a new language. Mm. Trying to understand how people think. Mm-hmm. And having to adapt to that, right? Okay. Yeah, that was that, that was a big part of of the learning experience. Like that was that was the fun part. I see. So you speak fluent Viet right now? Well, I always say, right, you are you are good at a third language if you can make someone laugh, make someone cry, and, <laughs> and be sarcastic. Yeah, that is sufficient. <laughs> it's sufficient. Yeah. Okay. So what made the switch to Yinsen? And you know, did did you? come across CY? Did you come across, you know, anyone that, you know? I think uh, I met CY in, in Vietnam. Ah. He was uh, back then setting up his port operations uh-huh. for Yinsen okay. uh, with PTSC. Okay. Uh, that's when we crossed path. Um, he was slightly younger than me, uh, you know, um, and we started, uh, you know, having dinners and spending time together. But over the course of time, you know, I also spent a lot of time with uh, the business contacts that he had there. Ah. Uh, his partners, PTSC. And uh, when I, when me and my, uh, our partners sold the uh, manufacturing business, um, I stayed on as uh, management. Mm-hmm. But when that contract came close to an end, 
then I thought, you know, eight years was about enough. You know, it was time to figure out what's next. Mm. And that was when uh, Yinsen just signed uh, their largest FPSO contract, which was FPSO Jack. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, let's see what I can contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, come back, join Yinsen. And basically the, the, the view was, you know, I mean, we were also friends, right? Uh, we had a, a kind of this ag unsaid agreement that if it didn't work, I, I have to be ready to quit. Mm. Right. So that's how it all started in terms of my career here as an employee at Yinsen. I see. And uh, it's been a good, what, eight years now? Yeah, correct. It's been about eight years. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe for the audience out there who do not know uh, Yinsen, uh, maybe their first time encountering Yinsen, maybe can you explain a little bit of the background of how Yinsen started, you know, even from CY's father? I mean, obviously we talk as if, because we, we, <clears throat> both of us are kind of like in the company yeah, yeah but to the, audi to the wider audience out there maybe you can share a little bit about the history of Yinsen from the trucking business all the way until it is today yeah it started, the business started by the father uh, way back in the 80s okay. uh, it started as a logistics company uh, including trucking mm -hmm. um, it was it was always profitable but very you know in a small way and, and I think the transformation started when we, we went to Vietnam, mm. right? Um, so CY, um, together with some of his, his business contacts, made a trip to Vietnam, mm -hmm. got introduced to some people and got, came across the opportunity where PTSC Corporation had a port that they were trying to develop, mm -hmm. right? And operate, but they had no experience doing it. Mm. Yeah, this was an oil and gas services company that had an orphaned asset that they just want to create value out of it. Mm. And so it all started with um, them being operators of the port, mm. uh, doing simple stuff, mm. bulk cargo, right? Um, and that's how we the relationship with PTSC started, mm. right? And leveraging on the contacts there, we started participating in offshore supply vessel bids, mm. right? And from brokering offshore support vessels, uh, the contracts started becoming attractive enough that we could then buy our offshore support vessels and charter them in, mm. right? So then that's when we started becoming from brokers in the offshore space to asset owners. Um, I think the big step up happened in 2011 when we won our first uh, floating storage and uh, offloading uh, project, mm. FSO, mm. FSO Bien Dong. Mm -hmm in partnership with PTSC, right? Uh, in all honesty, it was opportunistic mm -hmm. because the, the winning bidder actually dropped out, mm. right? And we were just there to fill in a gap. Mm. Uh, we were 49% partners. We knew nothing. So we were very much, to be honest, uh, financiers mm. because um, just before that, Vietnam had their Vinashin scandal. Oh, oh yes, yeah. I remember that one. So there was, there was a bit of lack of capital that are willing to back Vietnam projects. But we had um, the Singapore bank relationships, hmm. right? That we could bring to the table to get the project funded. I understand. Right. So that's, that's how we got into the, this floating uh, uh, storage and floating production offshore space. Okay. Right? Yeah. How do you access that risk? I mean now knowing looking back and then you're now the third largest FPSO you know um, operator in the world back then when the learning curve was so steep uh, risk assessment risk decision mat matrices right was it more of a gut feel I know it's it's an unfair question to ask you because it would be have it would have been CY and all that too but w would you be able to give us a glimpse like did CY share or yeah, his yeah, father I mean, share I mean, the stories I mean, of how he it, it was quite it was a measured risk because we took this perspective that uh, PTSC is a services company of the client. Mm -hmm. I mean, of uh, and it's a subsidiary of the client mm. in a way because PTSC is 50% uh, 50 owned by Petro Vietnam. Mm. And our client in this project was Petro Vietnam, mm. right? And we saw a country that was determined to have a lot of 
they had a, a country that had a lot of pride mm-hmm. and wanted to, to develop world-class oil and gas services company. I see. So on the client facing side, our view was the father will take care of the son. <laughs> okay. Right. And if I'm in the partners of the son, I should be all right. Mm. Okay. And when we looked at the, the numbers and the financing aspect of it, I mean, to put it very simply, we, 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 back then we didn't have the team we have today to assess contracts, right? Mm. So when we took that contract to a bank and said, can you finance this? Mm. And when the bank is willing to, to finance it on a, and all the more on a non-recourse basis, mm. then, you know, Why not, I guess, right? you know, it works. Mm. Because if you think about it, the cost of capital, right? The cost of bank, is the lowest, yeah, and then there's cost of uh, uh, equity, correct, and Which then is, in between there's quasi equity. That's right. So if they are the cheapest provider of capital and they are okay with it, yeah, and they don't need your guarantee for it, that's right. It's probably a, a decent contract. Correct, correct. So putting all that together, we we thought we uh, the company was making a, 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 a balanced decision, uh, measured taking measured risk. Understood. Uh, to take that step up. Understood. Into this space. Yeah, I I wanted to understand at that point of time because. You see, entrepreneurs, one thing, I, I don't know whether you agree or disagree with me, sometimes you got to dig deeper to your gut. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, yeah. I keep saying entrepreneur, but yeah. I, you have, I guess we just need to emphasize that the entrepreneur is, not, is, 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 is Mr. Lim and uh, Yeah, and yeah, why. correct, correct. It's a much smaller team. Yeah. I mean, decisions were that, that, that's right, that's yeah, right. So. That, that, that was the point I was trying to make because at that point of time, you know, like, we both kind of like come from a, a little bit of a corporate world and where there's already systems processes in place, banks have their due diligence process. Sometimes it's so intricate that there's an analysis paralysis. Right. Whereas an entrepreneur, when you have a crack team, you, you have probably 50, 60% information and you make that decision. I wanted to pry a little bit deeper on that. Yeah, like, because but, you yeah, know, we, yeah. we also reached out to our network of friends in, in Malaysia, right? Yeah. And back then, and, and it was boom, boom time back yeah. in 2011 Correct. in Malaysia, right? Correct. And when you, when you ask them, you know, hey, you know, simple things like, hey, have you been charged LDs? Mm, correct. And they say no. <laughs> so, so, oh, and they are not even subsidiaries of, of Petronas, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they were being nurtured under the VDP. Or, yeah, or, vendor uh, development program. Yeah. yeah. So we thought I mean, in this case, you know, we are working with the son of the client. Chari Gali equivalent yes, in a way. Yes, Chari Gali equivalent. Yeah. Yes, he is services arm of Petro Vietnam. Yeah. So we thought, okay, it's worth a shot. Mm, correct. Right. So probably for the audience, uh, v, uh, VDP stands for Vendor Development Program. This is something that is a uh, very, what do you call it? It's a structure or a system in a way to develop local vendors within the Petronas ecosystem. La. So yeah. just, it's just for the audience. Um, Okay, so great, you went from FSO chartering and then FSO and then FPSO. So maybe just a little bit of basics also. What's an FPSO and how does it fu- function, you know, uh, maybe to, to the audience who are not from this industry, actually? I mean, an FPSO is a flo- floating production, storage and offloading vessel. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's essentially a ship that stays on top of an offshore oil field. Mm-hmm. It has hoses, we call rises, Mm -hmm. coming up into it, right? It produces the hydrocarbons that come out Mm -hmm. from the seabed Mm -hmm. or the reservoirs, Mm -hmm. right? Into exportable crude, right? So there's storage in the hull, processing systems on top, and accommodation and power generation. And all it does is stay on the field to produce all the oil and gas that's in the reservoirs, right? Yeah. So unlike all the other uh you know services uh assets service assets right um this one is built specifically for the characteristics of the oil field Mm. right and therefore not immediately replaceable right so when you come to a oil price downturn it's not something that you can go out and find a cheaper one Mm. uh, on the market Mm. right Mm. Uh, it's a bespoke asset Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's why the contracting structure is entirely different from what you would have on an OSV, an oil rig, and even a drill ship. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. I, I like the the last point you made about bespoke. Um, perhaps uh, from an angle of why an FPSO versus a fixed platform. I think one key thing is uh, water depth, mm-hmm. right? 
uh, water depth and also uh, you know in, 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 in areas where you don't have the infrastructure in place already mm -hmm. right uh, and just a floater would, would just be a better solution mm. right uh, when we talk about infrastructure we're talking about pipelines that's right that, right that's right uh, and of course in the past there was this idea of uh, redeployment ability mm. redeployability of the asset mm -hmm. because it's a floater mm. uh, of course that's not always possible but sometimes possible. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, looking at the entire uh, field life of, a f <clears throat> of an FPSO, perhaps you could like share with us the parties involved in the entire FPSO um, ecosystem, for, for the lack of a better word. So, perhaps start with either an operator and then who are the guys, how, 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 how are contracts structured in such a way and who are the players? Lah? I think I think what you're getting at is what is the contracting structure between us and our client. Correct. Right. Correct. So all all company discovers a field, they find a huge reserve, they think production is X barrels per day mm -hmm. can go on for twenty years, right? So they will go to market and give the specs to mm -hmm. an FPS to a contractor and say, you know, this is the peak production, this is the amount of storage I want. Um, this is how long you need to operate the asset for. Mm. Give me a bare boat charter rate, mm -hmm. which is the charter rate for renting the asset, mm -hmm. and an O&M day rate, which is the operational and maintenance rate for the asset over the life. Mm. So for the oil company, they just want a very simple day rate, bare boat and O&M. For them, then they will go and look at their economics and say, what's my production? What's my forecasted oil price at different scenarios, mm. and you know, and then once they run the economics, they, they, they that will be part of their you know final investment decision, right? So typically, then the oil company will issue a tender mm -hmm. to qualified bidders. Mm. There will be a qualifying phase where you're supposed to submit your profile, your track record. Uh, your, your financial standing yeah ability you, to bank yes, this project yeah, ability, yeah. before you even get to submit uh, a bit right then you submit a bit um that is becoming less and less competitive over time it's something we can touch about later mm -hmm. um and what we do on our end is we do a capex build up mm. right based on the specifications that they give us we start speaking to all our vendors, hmm. all the key vendors for all the different components, you know, for power generation, there's a specialist for turbines, there's a specialist for gas compression, there's a, there's a specialist, right? And then we do a capex build up, and then we run a model, financial model, mm -hmm. right? Based on the targeted uh, internal rate of return, right? Based on financing costs after discussing with the banks mm -hmm. to get an estimate what kind of financing costs we we, uh, we can get mm. for this project? Then we get a day rate, mm. right? And then we, and then the management then needs to take a view how competitive the bid is, all right? To determine which end of um, the return range we want, mm. right? Obviously, in in a scenario like today where we are seeing less and less competition, uh, we just swing, swing for the fences, swing for the fences, right? <laughs> um, but it wasn't always like that. Mm. You know, there were there were times when it was competitive. Uh, I think I think I think that the changing of the financing landscape uh, and the two successive oil price downturn has changed that significantly. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of insights that I'm gonna I want to peel back first. Um, you talk about financing. Uh, the landscape has changed. Um, I completely agree with you. It's very difficult to finance today. Do you leave any margin of error because most of the rates today mm. that you secure are either fixed or floating? Am, am I getting how how many percentage of it are fixed? How many percentage of it are floating? Or do you like purely work on a fixed kind of rates for I your financing? As a group, we are like 60, 70 percent uh, swap to fix. Okay. Right. Uh, the floating components are mostly the short term, shorter term uh, loans that we take out uh, to kick off the projects. Mm, mm. In on a specific project financing piece, right? Most uh, club of lenders 
uh, would require you to swap to fix at least 70%. Mm. Right? Um, we have been fortunate. We have been quite uh, disciplined. So most of our project loans, project loans are, are mostly swap to fix. I see. Right? Because uh, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not in the business of... Uh, I'll be uh, arbitraging yeah, all this. You know, you know <laughs> trading or based on it, interest rates, right? Yeah. Uh, and the banks don't want us to take that risk either anymore. I understand. Right? So, we typically swap most of our project loans to fix. Okay. What we do, will do, after projects are, are run at a certain time, if they, they were financed at a high interest rate, is we, we will look to refinance understand. these projects out. I understand. For a lower interest rate and mm-hmm. a longer, longer tenure. I see. Because you need to remember, like if, if it's a fifteen year contract, the banks may be financing you on like eight years tenure. Mm. There's still a lot of cash flows beyond that, right? Mm. So four years in a project, you know, you and if the rates are, are low, mm. you, you can look at the refinancing. I see. Stretch out the tenure beyond that eight. I see. The year eight p- period. Okay. At a lower rate. I understand. Yeah. Um, is there a publicly disclosed IRR rate that you guys are comfortable and then what kind of margin of error you guys look normally looking at before you decide, hey, I'm going to walk away from this project, it doesn't make sense? Or it's like, uh, okay lah, somewhere there, I can stomach a little bit of risk. I mean, uh, we, have, we do have an internal uh, investment policy for both mm. uh, the RPSOs and our renewables. Mm. Uh, I obviously can't tell you what that is. Understood. Right? Uh and that obviously is changes as interest rate environment changes as well, right? Mm, mm, uh, mm. You can't say your internal rate of return is... Uh, Fixed at one rate and yeah, then... And then interest rate, <laughs> base rates has gone up. So, so it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's all look, looked at in, in, in relation to base rates as well. understand. Is there uh, a ballpark somewhere? A ballpark? No, I mean, look, when we talk about equity IRRs, right? I think... Today, for the FPSO space, high teens are the minimum. Okay. You know, minimum. Okay. Minimum. minimum. Mm. Right. Um, I think beyond that, there's the rates and then there's the contingency in the project capex. Mm. Mm. So there's two. Mm. You know, you can't be in a competitive environment. You can't, you, you can't have high <laughs> contingencies on your capex and also high. a higher R target. You can do that today, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, if you're the only bidder or you're a single source, right? Uh, negotiations, but uh, not, not, it's not always the case. Understand, right? understand. Yeah, you don't want to be double dipping or double margin of safety. Yes, la. correct. Understood. Um, okay, so you talked about um, the operator, you talked about the life cycle. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of investors worry about is actually your counterparty risk because your day rates are stretched for long periods of time. Uh, Usually you recognize one construction profit after the completion of the project and then you achieve first oil milestone, right? Then you get a big chunk of your payment. But the rest will be stretched quite a number of years. So putting on, like, let's just say an investor lens, uh, they see your your debt to equity is so high. They see your balance sheet is like loaded with, you know, and then you, like where you said, capex build and all that. How do, you, how do you counter that in a way for, I mean, to alleviate like, investors? In the reality is we are an infrastructure business. Mm. We are an energy infrastructure company. Mm. The FPSO is a, you know infrastructure asset within the energy production space. Mm. So, you know, uh, you know, I've met foreign investors or I've met some investors even locally that uh, have no issues with the debt to equity because they just understand it's the nature of the beast. Mm. Uh, we are no different from a highway or a power plant. Yeah. Right? Or TNB for, for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, we don't do the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, high, high gearing. gearing is the nature of the piece uh, because you spend your capex first, but you collect that over time. Mm. I think just to put the maths very simply, right? I mm. mean, you just have to look at uh, the, the, the the estimated capex versus the total amount of uh, charter income you're going to collect over time. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we've had assets, for example, that have a billion capex, mm. but you collect, say, 4.2 billion over time, mm. right? Uh, forget MPV, forget IRRs. Yes. Just look simple math. Ma- ma- simple math, right? Yeah. 
is it enough to pay your debt and equity? Three times, or why not? Yeah. <laughs> is it enough to pay down your debt and equity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If it yeah. is, then you're good to go. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, if you go to online, I'm pretty sure you understand. You go to online forums that people say Yinzer is going to go bankrupt or, you know, that kind of thing. There's, I think I'm trying to tease out the logical way of looking at things and mm. understanding the nature of the beast and understanding the industry. I think one other metric that, that, that some uh, analysts use is weighted average lease expiry. Ah. So if you look at weighted average lease expiry, we're looking at 20 years. Mm. If you look at a weighted average uh, debt, with the average uh, tenure of debt is mm. about five to all seven years. Yeah. I think that's very typical for a ca heavy capex project. Five to, five to seven is actually quite short already, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so with the average lease expiry is something people use for like uh, uh, REITs, for example, looking at REITs, right? Mm -hmm. Also, uh, as a heavy. Yeah. So, so there are a couple of metrics, uh, you know, net debt to EBITDA, uh, NPV, mm. uh, but like I said, right? Sometimes you just go back to simple maths. Okay, if it's four point two billion, in one billion, let's say four point two billion versus one billion capex. Okay, you, you, there's a lot of interest. Let's say you have interest on the capex. Yeah. Let's say it's one point five with all yeah. the interest, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there's enough cash in there. Yeah, right? more than enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the different uh, leases because there's bare boat charter and all that. Maybe you can explain to the audience, educate the audience about the different kinds of charter rates and what are the risks involved in each type actually. Okay. Um, the bare boat rate is essentially the rate that the client pays for renting the asset. Mm. Right? The risk in that is really delivering the project on time and on budget. Mm. Right? Uh, you you start the project with building up a you know a capex uh, on the desktop and speaking with your vendors, locking in POs, uh, and then getting the financing in. But if you and then based on that, you have a certain return because you've already committed a day rate, mm. right? Mm. So if you blow that budget, your return starts dwindling, dwindling, right? So the risk. Is really uh, delivering the project on bu on budget, right, and on schedule. Mm. On schedule because exceeding your schedule necessarily mean you exceed your budget, right? Having a project team, having the sh your FPSO in stuck in the shipyard, it's not cheap. Carry costs, all of this. Yes, right. So when you're late, you're gonna be over budget. There's no way you're gonna be late, and uh, only very rare circumstances. And this the delay is instructed by the client mm. and therefore compensated. Mm. That that's, that sometimes happens. Okay, so those are that's the risk in the, in the bare boat side of it, right? Uh, of course, building a quality asset then affects your ability to make sure that you are entitled to the day rates over time, right? The client expect you to have a very high uptime mm. because the opportunity cost of daily production is very high. Yes, right. On the O and M side, uh, it's really um, you know carrying out operations safely. Most of all, mm -hmm. keeping our people safe, mm -hmm. right? And then ensuring that the maintenance of the asset is sufficient so that the uptime is maintained. And then the other risk you have there is typically uh, inflation risk. But most contracts today bake in some inflation adjustment element mm. to the O and M rate, mm. which is something typically you don't get on the bare boat rate. I see. Because the bare boat rate, the cost is the cost; it's already fixed. I understand, yeah. and it's a depreci. There's kind of like a fixed depreciation yeah. table for it, right? Like. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah, the. What are the other, like, there's, uh, there's this thing called a time charter, correct me if I'm wrong. Time right? charter is, uh, is a combination of the both uh, lumped into one, one, one agreement. Okay. But uh, I think essentially it is, it, is, it is in essence, in substance the same. I see. Right. Uh, they are sometimes separated for, for tax uh, structuring reasons or, 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 or some, in some cases where the Operations and maintenance company is a third party. Ah, right? okay. Uh, you have that in Malaysia where there's uh, quite a few of e Yes. Uh, FPSO Ventures. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, bare boat, O and M, time charter. Any other con other contracting structures for? I mean, there's EPC. Okay. Uh, there's build, operate, and transfer. Okay. Uh, EPC is where you you know you go to a contractor and just, just all the company goes to a contractor and just deliver me the, the FPSO. FPSO our, Milestone, milestone is when uh, load out lah, yeah. load out first oil. O and M is completely settled by the operator. Correct. Right. And then build, operate, and transfer. How does that work actually? Build, operate, and transfer basically is like uh, 
they, they ask you to build an IPSO and only operate for a short period mm. before it's transferred to them. I see. The objective that all companies trying to get to is to make sure that you build something that's actually workable, mm. operation stabilized before I take over. I see. Right? I see. I think tendency when, when all companies go out for an EPC contract, if you tell me you're going to need 10 valves in this uh, in this top in this skit right or module I'm just going to put 10 valves mm. the cheapest possible way correct correct right? correct I don't care about oper- operability I don't care if it's going to last 25 years or yes. 15 years yes right That that's the problem uh, of of, of uh, going out for EBC contract right so I think different all companies have different strategy on how, how, how they contract FPSOs right yeah um but all keeping in mind that it is the most important component because it's we are the cash generating end, right? Drill, drilling rigs are uh, exploration assets that expenses expense, right? yes. Whereas we are the cash generating end. If the if the oil field is producing hundred thousand barrels per day, you know, at, at eighty dollar oil, yeah. the opportunity cost per day of lost production is huge. Yes, right? yes. I, I I love it that you put it this way. I think the audience who are not familiar with the oil and gas industry. Think of an FPSO as your cash register business and all the other expenses, which they are very expensive. Like you get a you, you get a deep sea, uh, deep water kind of drilling rig, a semi-sub, right? Yeah. You're talking about millions per day charter rate, but it's an expense, you know, and you may even end up with a dry hole. Correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's important to separate all the all, uh, offshore services assets, right? There's, yes. There's the value chain, exploration, the production. Correct. Exploration is always the first thing to get cut yeah. in a down cycle. Correct. But we are the production end. Correct. So long as the client is cash positive yes. on that field, they have every incentive to continue producing. That's a good one. Um, of your nine, eight vessels that you have right now, right, which is the most prolific? I, I can't remember off the top of my head actually right now. In terms of size, I think Agogo, which we are building for ENI in the Angola. Okay will be the largest in terms of production. Nameplate capacity? I think it's about 120,000 barrels per day. Wow, okay. Right? Okay. Uh, so it will be by, by far the largest capex and biggest production. Okay, okay. Right. And also the most, I think, is the high, one of the highest day rates in the world also. Uh, it's one of the higher day rates. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's public information that yes. uh, we also receive uh, up to five, we're going to receive up to 500 million US of upfront payments mm-hmm. to kick off the project. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it is. It is. I would say one of our better contracts in the portfolio. Um, there are smaller assets that actually have a higher return, mm. uh, but just don't have the absolute quantum. Understand? Uh, yeah, I, I think know. the smallest is probably like forty, fifty thousand barrels, right? The smallest we have uh-huh. uh, is smaller than that. Actually. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Lamson is is a very very small asset. Okay. Um, uh, it's what we started with. Okay. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the history of of Insight, we've been building capability and experience stepwise. Hmm. We didn't just wake up and say we want to do 100,000 <laughs> barrels per day, a billion plus dollar asset. You know, we started with FSO. Hmm. We started with a small FSO, hmm. FPSO, both on a joint venture basis, right? It was only after we acquired Fred Olsen Production hmm. with the team. That's right. With a bunch of producing assets in uh, Africa, right? Uh, Merge those t- our team with theirs. If then we did one project in Ghana, which is FPS with Jack, mm-hmm. in two thousand, I think it was two thousand fourteen, right? But for two years after that, right, we only did one thing and one thing only: mm. deliver Jack, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in, for in Ghana for year nine, right? Only after that did we start di- taking more projects, right? So, so we have been building capability stepwise over time, right? Uh, 2011 to now, it's been 12 years uh, to take the company from, I don't know, it was like a couple of hundred million. Yeah, to, to seven billion to, today. Yeah, seven plus, close to eight billion ringgit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, it, for some people, it felt like, oh, so fast. But it's actually, it's actually 12, 12, 12 years. 12 years, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, so 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 we where, where we are talking to people about our renewables business, we we always remind them hey, it took us twelve years to build what we built today. Bagi ruang sikit. Yeah lah. <laughs> Bagi <laughs> penafasan sikit. <laughs> uh, give us give us some room. Yeah, you don't want. I yeah. think I think it's a great point that um, rather than take the elevator, you took the stairs. Mm. 
and you also I think kind of reminded the essence of don't bite more than you can chew um, you don't want to suffer from indigestion build that technical capability that the foundation is strong actually on this point I just wanted to make a comment and it's actually a compliment towards Zinsen so one of the reports I can't remember I think one of the years right after you acquired Fred Olsen um, you your your technical guys started writing about technical authorities putting in frameworks putting in kind of standardized design because if you keep on doing customized design it's a lot of uh, reinventing the wheel and for me that really struck me because I was a shell for 10 years mm. right and it was like wow these guys are like <laughs> they're adopting shell which is like a hundred year old company mm. these kind of standards and I think kudos my hats off to you compliment that compliments that you know you, you're trying to be efficient in this very organic way but most people outside the industry wouldn't, wouldn't understand you see yeah yeah, right. yeah. yeah. I, think, I think I think but but yeah, we 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 are not shell. We cannot adopt every everything that shell does. So we are fit for purpose. Correct. Right. Uh, being adaptable. Yeah. So that 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 is what's enabled us to deliver projects on time and schedule so far. Understand. Right. Understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Usually, what are the most common difficulties or risks of an FPSO project? I I think maybe I I know the story, but I want you to share this story about when you had to. Uh, cut Batam and move it to China. Maybe you can, you know, share with the audience that story about think, Ananeri. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, FPSO Ananeri for Petrobras. Uh, we contracted. We won the project. Uh, I think somewhere in twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, original plan was, you know, this is our first big project mm. after FPSO uh, Jack. Jack, right? In between, we did FPSO Halang. Mm. But we thought, okay, well, let's do it the same way, you know, mm. build all the top sites in the different top site yards in mm. Batam, mm. in Vietnam, mm. uh, do the hull in China, mm. and do the integration in Singapore. Mm. And when things started getting a little bit, you know, scary on uh, the developments of COVID in China, um, we decided to concentrate all the construction effort in China, mm. right? Uh, instead of uh, having this uh, distributed uh, execution model, right? And that is the reason why throughout COVID, we are the only FPSO project to be delivered on time and on budget. Uh, because China was close to the world, but in China, while we were struggling there, uh, China was actually open for business, right? It was... Why not the other way around? Just just trying to be the devil's advocate. Why not like because uh, China imposed such strict restrictions? Why not even the hull was moved over to Batam or Singapore versus that you're know, moving top sites and the modules over to China? What what was the key things that you saw in China? I think more more complete capability to complete an FPSO mm. and the availability of labor. Mm, mm. Um, those were the, some of the considerations, right? Yeah, uh, and. You know, we just took the view that you may not be able to move people uh, across borders easily. Mm. Um, so that 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 call was, I think, critical uh, to why we already have FPSO and NRE already achieved first on of an acceptance. Mm. I think there are many projects that were awarded before us that are still in the shipyard. Wow! 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 So. so but it took large, a big sacrifice from our project team, obviously. Um, some did not see family for two plus years. Wow. Those that wanted had to do multiple weeks of quarantine. Because <laughs> yeah. it's usually two on, two off. And then the two off, you have to quarantine some more. <laughs> so virtually... No, two on, two off. I mean... 45, 45. Uh. No, they were, some of them were in, the, we were in China for two and a half wow. years. Wow. Wow. So yeah. Malaysians and uh, whoever. Lah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I hope CY gave them a very big bonus. Uh-huh. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go a little bit uh, technical here. Um, will you as an FPSO uh, contractor, for the lack of a better word, because you have to build you have to build it, does subsurface risk actually impact you guys or not? In the sense that because designs may change with new subsurface parameters and and, and uh, new data being acquired. 
uh, at which point do you like, hey, guys, if we change this design now, it's going to really impact the modules, the weight and whatever. So how, how do you guys manage that kind of changes, actually? That will, typically, when the client issues a uh, tender, the design and specifications are based on that. Okay, it's frozen at that point. Once the contract has been awarded, <laughs> right, we have locked in those parameters, then any changes would then give us an opportunity to issue a variation order okay. or VO, yeah. right? Uh, so they need to get their stuff right. sorted out before they contract us. Otherwise, uh, it will be a costly VO. I know. Right. If the v even if they said, oh, I'm willing to pay the VO, you know, there yeah. they will be a line drawn to say, hey, it's not just about the money, it's about timelines. That's it's about both. Yeah. Variation will cover both, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the smart contractor would, would use this, if they are already behind schedule, would use this opportunity to extend the schedule <laughs> as well, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, and we both get extra money and extra time to yeah. deliver. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, let's look at about um, purpose built versus a conversion. I think some of uh, your projects are purpose built. Some of it is conversion and maybe to the benefit of the audience. Where would be a pivoting moment to decide, or whether the operator decides or you decide? Oh, yeah, three. There, yeah. there, there, sorry, there, there are three, yeah. three, three types, right? Yeah. Uh, purpose built. What we talk about is a new build. Yeah. Even from the hull. Yeah. Uh, conversions. We are talking about using uh, existing oil tanker, and converting that into FPSO. Correct. Then the third one is called uh, uh, upgrade. Mm. Upgrade of existing FPSO to fit yeah. the characteristics of the new field. Yeah. So that's three. That's three. Right. So how do you decide? Does the operator decide or you guys actually propose? Typically, the tender documents will will, will uh, specify what they require. Mm -hmm. a, a, a new build will typically be required for fields that have very, very long field life. Ah. Right? Conversion can be used for long field life as well. Right? Uh, there's some school of thought that thinks that because the house is already constructed, mm. save some time, mm. right? In today's world, uh, I think there's a little bit more of the new builds, especially I see. for the mega fields that are producing upwards of 150,000 barrels mm -hmm. per day. Mm -hmm. And then the upgrades are the very odd chance where you have existing FPSO that's idle, mm. where the characteristics of the mooring system, production capacity, uh, and processing facilities suit the new field. Mm. Then that gives you shorter project time, mm -hmm. uh, smaller uh, capex, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in general, better economies for both the client and the contractor. Understood. But, and right? But very rare occasions. Very are. rare. But to be even though we say rare, I think in we have done three reading performance. That's right? right. That's right. Right. I think Helang was one. Helang was one. Abigail Joseph was one. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing uh, the Inauta one, right? Mm. Uh, FPSO Atlanta. Mm. So in terms of redeployments, I think we we have put our mark there, uh, right? I don't think there's anybody competing with us in that space. Understood. It's Understood. Not a space SBM does. Not a space. Space Modec does. Or not Modec. Space Modec does. Yeah. So it's a sweet spot for us. Okay. But like like you said, they are not. They don't come by every day. Understood. Mm -hmm. I remember there was one, and I don't know whether it's twenty twenty or twenty nineteen, that you were very keen to buy FPSO Nagura, which was like an idle. Yeah. BB. It's idle. Uh, it's owned by Woodside Petroleum. Mm -hmm. We still have the exclusive rights for FPSO Nagura. Okay. Uh, we have on signed the exclusive rights to BP. Okay. For a project in Angola. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we hope uh, we will secure uh, subsequent uh, to let us let's say sailing away FPS to Atlanta mm, right, mm, mm, right? Mm, mm. so that will be another upgrade project I see I see if so, we get it and so, so it's option on the table lah. yes okay um, I know it's going to sound uh, arbitrary to ask this question but a lot of people think like an FPSO provider uh, have direct correlation to prices of the oil. <laughs> no. Yeah. So maybe can you explain uh, in terms of the if, if there is any correlation and how are the contract rates actually priced in the day rates? Are, are yeah. they? Yeah. The, there is no correlation to the day rates. We are building a purpose-built asset bespoke for you. So we are out of the pocket let's say a billion, a billion US dollars, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you've committed to pay me a day rate. Mm -hmm. 
I not only want you to sign a contract, I want you to provide a parental company guarantee mm. for the charter payments mm, mm, mm. and also all the payments in, in, in the event of a termination. Why? Because it's not something I can just plug and play somewhere else and offer to somebody else on you know, another oil field. Mm. Right? So that, that, that's key. It's bespoke. I can't plug and play it on another oil field. Understood. That's why the contracting structure is the way it is. I understand. Right? I understand. Uh, so, I, oil price up or down, the client has to pay me. If, if there's really no oil and we have experienced it before, then you have to terminate the contract. Mm. Right? And when you terminate the contract, you have to pay me an early termination payment that, was, that will pay out all my, 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 my project lenders. Yeah. And they will also help me recover most of my equity. Yeah. And I keep the vessel. Ah. So our ideal scenario is really, okay, you know, if you want to terminate me, terminate me early. Yeah. So I have a, a younger asset that I can redeploy. Yeah. Right? Rather than yeah. spend I, money to refurbish. It, it, it's like, it's a it's an early prepayment of lease. Mm. For, for us in terms of termination, right? Understood. And we've experienced that in, in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, FPS or Lamson. Mm-hmm. The, the production was way below what they expected. Ah. They, they terminated us. I see. Right? We got a termination fee. But the national company took a view that they want to continue production. We offered them a lower day rate. And, and FPS Lamson has served way beyond its fixed term. It's wow. finishing its extension term now. And, you know, we, we basically doubled it in, in a way. You know, of course, on a much lower rate, right? Understood. But it was a win-win for both parties as well. Uh, it's a win-win for both parties. Yeah. It's still economical for them to run the oil field. Yeah. Great. So I'm going to move more towards uh, financial performance questions. Uh, current market cap about 7.5, 7.6 billion ringgit or 1.65 US dollars, billions US dollars. Um, investors who started with you 2011, from 2011 until today, probably 100, 110 times, you know, uh, how I wish I bought it back then as well. But what next? What's the next five-year goals actually? I think in today's world, um, energy transition is something we are, we are all aware of some things on our minds. Mm-hmm. We're just, everybody has a different conviction on what pace yeah. is going to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we are convinced it will happen. And we are also, you know, always deliberating at what pace it will happen. Right. Uh, but we, we want keeping in mind that it took 12 years to build the business today. Right we are conscious that we, we can't just switch overnight and replace those earnings with another business. Yeah, you can't so, destroy that overnight. Yeah, actually. so we, we, we need to continue to, uh, we need to seed the new business today. Understand. Right? To build the, the, the next earnings growth mm-hmm. and also potentially the, the earnings replacement over time. Mm, mm. Right? So the way uh, we are thinking as a company strategically is we're gonna, the world gonna need more energy. Mm. We're going to deliver more energy mm. where it's conventional energy. We're going to do it at the least harm to the environment, mm. which means the lowest emission intensity per barrel. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do, deliver more energy in the form of renewables. Mm-hmm. And we're also going to invest selectively in a small way in innovation. I see. So it's energy and innovation. Understood. It's two things that we believe uh, is going to anchor the company's future, right? More energy, less harm to the environment, and innovation. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I have a lot of questions on your green one later, uh, but we'll move more into the financial one first. I'm very excited to learn about your green one. I spoke to your uh, movie guys yesterday, actually. Yeah. I was supposed to go to Putrajaya, but... Um, Cyberjaya. Cyberjaya, sorry. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I had a bit of a... I was a little bit under the weather, but... So revenue is about 8.3 billion ringgit. Um, gross margins been declining though from the high 50s to less than 30. Uh, what do you think contributed to the decline? Is it a product uh, mix? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's entirely due to accounting treatment. Mm. Where before all our FPSO assets were recognized on operating lease. Ah. So, so operating lease, uh, you, you spend your money building the asset and then you... Once you hit first oil, you have a charter income, right? At operating level, all you have is charter income, not much cost, an operating cost, right? And maybe insurance cost. Yes. And then your gross profit. Yeah. Right? So like most le- uh, leasing businesses, you have a high gross profit margin. Correct. But 
when we started adopting finance lease, which is a requirement uh, under accounting standards, yeah. right? After assessments of the different contracts, that made us have to recognize an EPC profit. Mm, construction right? profit. Construction profit on a finance lease contract. Mm, mm, mm. And that is typically recognized at anywhere from a 10 to say 12% margin. I see, right? I see. So that itself is the biggest contributor to the change in, in, in margin. Understood, yeah. understood. Okay. Um, balance sheet. Currently, total liabilities hover roughly around about 14 billion. Uh, market cap is only half of liabilities. I think you did answer this a little bit uh, earlier, uh, but how do you alle alleviate investor fears actually? I mean, let me look at it, right? <laughs> uh, 14 billion ringgit. But, you know, you need to balance that. You cannot look, you know, when you look at things, you cannot look at isolation. Correct, correct, correct. Then you need to look at how much cash flows these the the debt was used to build assets yes that have contracts with cash flows correct so then you look at how much contracted cash flows we have mm. it's 22 billion us dollars yes at today's exchange rates it's probably gonna, gonna be higher gonna, gonna touch 100, 100, 100 billion ringgit yeah okay then you, okay like you know, let's just simplify it again right uh it's 100 billion ringgit enough to pay down you know 14 billion i, I i'm not sure it's 14. Yeah. I think it's probably nine on, on nine. Yeah. yeah, I think this one I included all your liabilities. Okay. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say you have a couple of billion more ringgit to draw down for a complete the project. Yeah. There's still a a gap there, right? Yes. Yeah. Even if I have to pay some interest uh, yeah. for the debt. Yeah. So yeah. enough for a private jet in between. I'm just I'm yeah. just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think I'd rather I'd rather put that money into a cash generating asset like yeah, uh, another FPSO, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've raised three rounds of rights: once in twenty twelve, another in twenty fourteen, and the last, the latest one was Agogo twenty twenty three. Um, I think in my discussions with you and probably CY in the past, um, you don't look at probably another short to medium term, another rounds of rights, but. Will you foresee uh, other bigger projects, let's say 150,000 barrels requiring another round of rights? Or do you think that your balance sheet is sufficient to take on that kind of size? I think there's enough capital within the group for us to uh, recycle that capital. Mm -hmm. That's a question about timing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then redeploy the capital for the next growth asset, right? Understand. We did our last rights last year. We raised 1.2 billion ringgit, uh -huh. right? The previous right in 2014, I think it was about 500 million, right? So we raised maybe 1.7, but we've probably paid about 700 million dividends in that 10, 11 years. Yes, yeah. Right. So net raise that time was maybe, uh, let's say, oh, what, what is it? 1.4, 700, uh, half, la, 700. Half, right? la. Um, but 700 million in US dollar terms, less than 200 million. US, yeah. Right. So. If you look at the amount of the enterprise value we have built for for our shareholders, yes, it's much more. It's massive, right? Yeah. And not let's not talk about the order book. Yeah. The cash flows that uh, these assets are going to generate. So I think I think there's a lot of cash flows uh, within our our infrastructure assets. Hmm. A lot of uh, opportunities to monetize those cash flows. Hmm. A lot of opportunities to monetize the equity hmm. uh, to to recycle as well. Yeah, so the, the short answer is, you know, we, we just want to go go. Uh, it's, it's a project that's obviously above a billion US dollars. Yeah. You don't hear us coming out. To, you, don't, you don't hear us scrambling around uh, looking for, for fin financing our rights issue. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so no, 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 rights, no rights issue in the near future. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the short, simple answer. Understood. I think last question on finance is, um, which did touch a little bit on it, but maybe for the benefit of the audience about counterparty risk. So there's something that I had the privilege that you and CY shared with me before. There are some FPSO operators where they are, the operators that they are leasing to or they're, they're being leased to, the the size of the company is even less than the charter rates and the yeah. entire project, right? How, how do you guys deal with counterparty risk? Maybe explain for the benefit of the audience on Okay. Counterparty the, risk. Uh, there, there are different qualities of counterparties. There's the international and, and uh, you know oil majors, large IOCs, mm -hmm. and oil majors and NOCs. Yeah. Right. This class of uh, 
counterparties are typically very bankable. Mm. Typically. Mm. Um, uh, of course, NOCs are depending on which country. Okay. Right? So, the first test, right, of the quality of the counterparty and the quality of the charter contract is when you take it to your project lenders, mm. are they going to fund it on a non-recourse basis? Mm. If they're happy to fund it on a non-recourse basis, you know, with a high amount of debt relative to equity, debt equity scalp, mm. then that's what we consider a good counterparty. Understood. Right? Mm. So there's a lot of that going on in the background when a chart, when a tender comes out, right? There's a lot of assessment uh, at the management level presented to the board, mm -hmm. right? Not just on the CAPEX build-up, the economics, the numbers, but the assessment of the counterparty, mm. right? Uh, so that, that, that's one class, right? Then that, when, where the rest where we consider not so bankable. So these are typically companies that are independent oil companies. Mm. Uh, one or two oil fields don't produce a lot. Net cash, but not like, you know, not, not huge piles of cash. Mm. Um, then typically we wouldn't have, we wouldn't take CapEx risk on them. Mm. We would expect them to fund the CapEx, mm. right? Understood. Yeah. Understood. When you say non-recourse, maybe explain to the audience. So non-recourse is when um, the, the banks are happy to take the risk of the client's payment and the cash flows of the project and they don't require the, the at Yinsen to provide an additional layer of guarantees mm. in the event there's no non-payment of those contracts. Yeah. So maybe if I explain it in a simpler manner, let's just say Yinsen builds uh, Operator A, uh, a FPSO, 1 billion. The bank will not go after Yinsen once the, the, the project's already in charter, start operating. If the operator A is not paying Yinsen, right. they will chase after operator A. The banks will chase after operator A rather than chase after Yinsen. Yeah, something along those lines. Yes, yes. correct. Okay. Yeah. So 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 in, in, in projects where we have the parent company guarantee for those charter payments, right, there's actually an official document to assign the goods guarantees mm. to the lenders. Mm. Right. So in the event of non payment, the lenders will be calling on that guarantee. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So now, the green energy questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, renewable energy pipeline, you've got whoa, Latin America, Italy, India, Indonesia, I think Philippines also, you're studying some. So what are the hurdle rates or some of the key factors you guys uh, set before you can stomach any project actually? I think, like it or not, uh, the rate of return of renewable projects are lower. Mm. But that being said, the cost of capital is also lower. Mm. The cost, the risk of execution is also much lower. Mm. So again, you cannot look at returns in isolation. Mm. You have to look against the risk adjusted uh, return, yeah. which means against the cost of, uh, the risk of executing the project and also look at the What's the cost of capital? Understood. Right? Understood. Uh, so, 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 the way we see it is in the longer term, right? And there, there, there is a lot of value creation that can be created out of it. Um, some people will tell you a single digit, mm. right? But the way we are look, approaching projects is we are looking at originating projects from Greenfield, mm. right? From the point of site investigation to permitting, construction permits, sign getting the PPAs, getting the um, environmental impact assessment done, you know, and taking it through construction and then own and operate. Hmm. That typically allows us, at least in the regions where we are exploring, uh, to get into the double digit area, right? Understood. For, for, for returns. Understood. Right? Um, so that's how we are, we are looking in terms of a building a uh, renewables business. I see. Um, your your, your push, I mean, you have a dedicated subsidiary for green tech. You've got marine, urban mobility, micro mobility, even charging infrastructure. It's, it's comprehensive, but also very wide ranging. And do you think that it's a, a stretch of resources or rather you think it's more synergistic effort? So I think renewables, we have three, you know, we, the core business units, right, is uh, FPSOs. Mm -hmm. Renewables, yeah, and then green tech. Green tech, correct. Green tech is where you see there's a, a, a bunch of investments that are all centered around mobility mm -hmm. and electrification. Yeah, right. Whether it's marine, uh, two wheelers, four wheelers, charging solution, right, uh, commercial vehicles. Yeah, right. So yes, they look like a whole bunch of different things that you have to look at, but 
they're all aiming to solve one thing, right? Mobility and electrification. Mm. Uh, and if you take a step back, you know, <coughs> excuse me. You, you start to think whether or not you can package this and all into a, mm. a single smart smart city solution, for example. Mm, mm, mm. Right? Smart mobility solution mm. for urban mobility. Mm. Right? Yeah. So wrapping all that up is whether or not you have uh, the ability to deploy and also the software stack. Ah. Right? So that's the, also the area where we are focused on. I see. Right? I uh, see. Ensuring we have the, uh, the platform, right? In order to, to, to bundle all these services uh, together. Yeah. It's interesting you spoke about software stack. I, I just recently spoke to AK of uh, Agmo and, um, and looking at his Agmo EV, um, one of the most comprehensive, I think, in terms of... So do you see outsourcing or in-housing this software stack uh, as either a dilutive thing or either... Uh, I think we're doing a combination of both. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, we want to be in, 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 in control of uh, what is consumer-facing. Uh, and, ah, okay. So okay. It is what the consumers are going to see. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to see your charger uh, you know, at a rest stop uh, immediately, but what they're going to see immediately is really the app. Mm. Right, mm. so we 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 doing a bit of both, and okay. we want to be in control of what and what is the consumer is seeing. I see, I right. see. Okay, okay. Um, right now, you don't uh, break down your subsidiaries uh, by line item. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I read a few of your annual reports. Um, is there a plan to include a breakdown P and L of each of these subsidiaries in the future? And if not. Why? If yes, when are we likely going to see it? Actually, I think uh, in our quarterly briefings, we start to segregate uh, the segment results for renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, for green tech, not yet. Okay, it's too small. Okay, right. So I think that will come in the future. Okay, but uh, I think for the green tech segment, you know, it it it, it will, at the initial years is very much about the value creation rather than talking about you know uh, profits immediately right mm, mm, mm. Uh, what you will see you know I always say is 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 my FPSO business if I take to infrastructure guys and public equities they understand mm. renewables I take to equity guys public infrastructure uh, banks they understand mm. I take my green tech stuff uh, you know the people that would put the highest value to it are VC funds and mm, correct equity correct and industry mm. players correct right so Okay, uh, for my green tech assets, where we are getting interest from investors, it's really that category: VC funds and private equity. Understand, right? Understand. So, they will need more capital to build out these businesses before they become profitable. Understand. That capital does not necessarily need to come from us only. Understand. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. But so, in terms of messaging. What you're trying to say is that rather than trying to bring it to public markets in terms of messaging and alignment, internally behind the scenes, you feel that the private equity space, the VC space would be more of the attractive crowd yes. that you're looking for. Right. And, yeah. and, and they will mark the value. Okay. Right. Uh, and, and, and whether or not the public equity guys take it into some of us, that's up, up to the market, right? Understand. Yeah. Understand. But, but I think I think key thing at this point is you know we have we have a great business in FPSO, right? No co less competition, mm. right? Um, cl clients that are flushed with cash and willing to pay. Yeah, right. Yeah. But energy transition is real. It's going yeah. to happen, and we just don't know what pace. Yeah. So I'll quote what CY always tells us: "Is I want to, I want to change, or I want to try, and." new things when I can, not when I have to. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. So we don't want to be in a position at 2030. <laughs> and you're caught with your pants down. Yeah. Yeah. You got a whole bunch, you know, of uh, assets that, you know, really uh, that um, not, not, not the flavor of the month mm. or the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you had the time capacity to actually build the capability, the know-how and, you know, maybe even understand the project economics even better by, you know, all this green tech. Right. Yeah. Um, probably one of the final few questions. Um, attracting talent. Um, roughly, ballpark, 
what is the attrition rate that you guys are getting? I mean, you know, today you go to graduates, university graduates, oh, don't go into oil and gas, it's dirty, it's a dying industry and all that. But are you seeing that problem <laughs> of attracting talent? Because we have, we, we, we have a couple of things to offer, right? We have a very international presence. Mm. You know, when we say international, we really have offices. We have offices in Brazil, we have offices in Oslo, Singapore. We have offices in Ghana, we have mm. offices, uh, and we talk about major offices alone. It's uh, Rio, Oslo, Singapore, here, yeah. right? Uh, so there's, there's opportunity to travel. Mm. And not only that, then we also opportunity, opportunity to look at different businesses, right? Mm. Um, so when, when, when we, we are talking to young, young graduates today, it's something that actually attracts them. I understand. Uh, our, our view on transition, our willingness to invest uh, in, 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 in the green tech space and yeah. renewables, yeah. right? If we were just tone deaf <laughs> to all these, I think then yes, we, 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 you, know, you would probably struggle Understand. to, to, to uh, attract young uh, and fresh talent. I understand, right? yeah. So, you know, it's not, it's not just about satisfying investors. It's, when you talk about stakeholders, it's, it's really everybody, including your potential uh, new talents. Right? Yeah. Um, you still haven't let me in on the secret how you secured TJ to come over. But anyway, story for <laughs> <laughs> story for maybe, yeah, are, you, yeah. are you happy to share? Uh, no, no. I think I think what, what maybe what 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 you should have is an honest com coffee conversation with him and what what the experience is like, right? Yeah, I'm jumping over from uh, the bank. Yeah, to the corporate side. Correct. So, uh, so it's an inside joke. So I better 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 hi uh, give context to the audience. So TJ was actually, I think, regional head of research, right, for uh, Maybank? I think, no, it's sector. Sector head for oil and gas, right, uh, for Maybank. Uh. Yeah, and uh, he just recently joined uh, Yinsen as the chief of staff. Uh, when I saw the an announcement, wasn't too surprised, but also was like, hmm, okay, it's, this guy is like 20 over years, 30 years in the analyst, I mean, I sales. Our, our, our view of, uh, of stakeholder engagement is, uh, um, I don't know, um, the company needs to take on a lot more of the burden of uh, reaching out to the investors, stakeholders. Precisely. Right. And when you look at that, then you start thinking about what resources you need to do that. Right. Mm, mm. Uh, you have a situation where uh, commissions on, on trading are so compressed yeah. uh, that, you know, you, the ability and resources that a broking house has or investment bank has it's also, you know, uh, constrained somewhat, right? So in, in that, in that light, you know, um, and thinking about taking a company from this level to the next, you just have to think about what resources you need. And, and I think we, you know, we hope we, we brought the, the, the right resources yeah. to help us, you know, do more of that engagement on our own and expand, uh, the, the audience to which we are reaching out to. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, you have any more vacancies to carry your bag, JJ? <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, probably one last question um, with regards to um, the energy transition and also where Yinsen is. Um, I think in your deck, you quite clearly highlighted the Lim family, EPF, Co-op. You know, uh, for those of you who have not even bought Yinsen shares indirectly, if you're an EPF contributor, you're a shareholder, <laughs> right? Um, what would you say to uh, your stakeholders, especially shareholders, in terms of your kind of like your fiduciary duty in bringing this company forward? Actually, I think we, you know, even CY sees himself as a professional manager. Uh, we we are always listening to what our stakeholders have to say: mm. shareholders, banks, mm. clients, mm. Uh, because really. Uh, only then, you know, you, you get a good sense of how you're going to steer the company. Understood. Right? Because it determines your ability to access capital, uh, your, your ability to deliver share value, right? And how you're going to drive the comp company forward. Mm. You cannot be doing things on a whim or fancy of one individual just because he's the single largest shareholder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that mindset cascades, right? Uh, to the management in terms of how we see our fiduciary duty is to deliver shareholder value right uh, at the same time 
taking care or you know that that there's a there is a there's a pie right or there's a there's a cash flow stream yeah you have to make sure that cash flow streams uh, that's that's enough to satisfy your lenders your equity holders still reinvest pay your staff well yeah you know create a nice working environment for them a decent office right and then you can figure out whether or not you want to what you want to do with the rest yeah right it's just that stack right and of course beyond that and composing all that is of course your responsibility as 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 part of uh i don't know of of a corporate in in in, in larger landscape right your responsibility towards the environment right uh in terms of you know understanding your esg impact right uh operating as a business right yeah yeah um JJ, thank you so much for your time. You. I, I I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope the audience actually took a lot. For me, I, I felt it was a lot of good key insights. You have to read in between the lines sometimes, <laughs> especially contracting strategies, right? Yeah. Um, look forward to maybe you know um, having even CY or sure. I think his dad is quite media shy, right? Uh, uh yeah, I think we we are. We are quite media shy company. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we are out there with our with our LinkedIn and our website. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much again for your time. Uh, to the audience out there, if you love content like this, uh, hit the subscribe button, give it a like, so that the YouTube algo can actually you know spread it to more enlightened uh, uh, investors and uh, people who want to have a growth mindset. And thank you so, so much. So we are media shy, but when, when, when John requested, you know, it is something I, I, we, we are obliged because I, I think, I think you're, you guys are doing good, good content. Thank you. Uh, good content and, and, you know, really um, helping the public and uh, retail investors especially understand uh, the Malaysian listed, listed landscape. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we, we endeavor to do our best. Uh. Yeah. Thanks, JJ. Thank you.